Kevin Camps, a radioactive waste specialist, says the condition of the high-level radioactive waste storage pools at the Fukushima Daiichi reactors remain dangerous. Another big earthquake could promote a sudden drain down of the Unit 4 high-level radioactive waste storage pool. Camps also says that few lessons from Fukushima have been learned in the U.S., one of the most important being that high-density U.S. pools should be emptied into hardened on-site storage as soon as possible. This being before the worst could happen, whether due to an earthquake or a potential terrorist attack in the United States. Scientists say that very low levels of radiation from the Fukushima nuclear disaster are now about to reach ocean waters along the U.S. West Coast next month, but it will not be at levels dangerous to humans or wildlife. They're calling for more monitoring as no federal agency currently samples Pacific Coast seawater for radiation. They say unless we have results, how do we know it's safe? It's been three years since the Fukushima disaster and thousands in Japan have called on the government to rid themselves of all their nuclear power for good. Kevin, welcome to the program. Thanks a lot for having me. Kevin, uh, what is the reality behind the radiation on the West Coast reaching California? Well, any claims that it's not at dangerous levels need to be taken with a grain of salt because it's been known for decades. And it's not me saying this, it's the U S national academies of, of science that any exposure to ionizing radioactivity, no matter how small the dose carries a health risk for cancer and the higher your exposure to ionizing radioactivity, the greater the risk and these risks accumulate for a lifetime. So uh, well, are these government agencies being honest with the American people by saying that, that, well, there's no threat, but clearly there is a threat. I think there's a lot of secrecy. There's a lot of cover-up. There's a lot of minimization. And this goes back to the earliest days of the atomic age with the Manhattan Project. Incredibly enough, the same behavior takes place on the so-called peaceful atom side of the coin. So it's a constant battle to get the truth out. We, we have that battle here in the U.S. They certainly have the same battle in Japan. Well, are they, are they simply making these statements because they're trying to avoid panic? I think more to the point is that the nuclear power industry here in the United States is very politically powerful, very economically powerful. They have a lot of friends in high places in government, including, of course, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, just today, there's breaking news that the NRC Office of Public Affairs knew a whole lot more about what was going on at Fukushima in the first days uh, that they did not reveal to the American people. Here it is three years later and through the Freedom of Information Act, finally more truth is coming out, but it took three years to get there and a prolonged you know, struggle with the NRC. So it's been three years now, what have we learned? Well, we've learned that this is a global catastrophe. You mentioned the other shoes that have not yet dropped at Fukushima Daiichi and we pray that they don't. Those are the high-level radioactive waste storage pools. We're still not out of the woods with those. They're slowly moving the irradiated fuel out of the Unit 4 pool. That building is shattered by the earthquake, the tsunami, and a large-scale explosion. They've had to rebuild the building, essentially, and it took them from March of 2011 until November of 2013 to get that far. And only then could they begin to remove the fuel. It takes a 100-ton load this waste transfer cask to get the waste out of there. They're moving very slowly. Or they're about 20% of the way done with the job now since November. So how, is, how, are the the pools, how are these storage pools constructed? At the uh, General Electric Mark I boiling water reactors, which is what you have at Fukushima Daiichi, the pools were designed for maximum convenience to the company. Move the irradiated fuel out of the operating reactor core into the storage pool, which is right next door. Unfortunately, that's 50 feet up in the air, which has meant they haven't been able to get that waste out of there in all this time. And the Unit 3 pool right next door, which suffered the worst explosion at Fukushima Daiichi three years ago, we don't even know the status of that pool or the waste inside, and we fear that the status is worse than a Unit 4. 50 tons of debris fell into the Unit 3 pool, likely doing damage to the fuel. So they're doing the easiest stuff first at Unit 4. They're going to run into problems at Unit 4 with damaged fuel, vent fuel, corroded fuel. They use salt water to cool the waste. That probably corroded the fuel. So there's difficulties to come just with that. 
Now, what about the people of Japan? They're calling for closure of nuclear power plants there. Uh, how close is that to becoming a reality? Well, actually, there are no operating reactors in Japan, and that's been the case pretty much for the last three years. There have been a couple of, of exceptions to that, but there are 48 still operable reactors across Japan. The six reactors at Fukushima Daiichi, the four were destroyed by the catastrophe, and two more that were not destroyed, the company chose to simply retire. So that took six reactors off of the table in Japan, but there are 48 still operable and there's been this massive tug of war, to put it mildly, between the Japanese people and the pro-nuclear Japanese government that's under the influence of this industry. To this day, there are still no operating reactors, but Prime Minister Abe and his Liberal Democratic Party, it's their top priority to turn reactors back on. Despite clear risks, some of the reactors that they're looking to restart have earthquake fault lines directly beneath them, not nearby, under the plants. So it's a, it's a massive struggle. You're seeing protests in Japan of 250,000 people at the prime minister's residence, which is essentially unprecedented. There may have been protests like that in the 1950s for other issues like labor issues, but it's just incredible groundswell of public outpouring in Japan. Kevin, what is the worst case scenario if we do not repair storage pools of high level radioactive waste in the United States? Well, um, the worst case scenario is a sudden drain down of the water. And this could happen if a heavy load is dropped into the pool, punching a hole in the floor, draining the cooling water away. It could also happen due to an earthquake or a tornado strike. So there's any number of scenarios that could quickly drain away the water in a high-level radioactive waste storage pool. After the cooling water is gone, it's also the radiation shielding for the workers. So the gamma dose rates near the pool would be instantly fatal at that point, which means people cannot approach the pool and take any mitigating actions. And that was a problem at Fukushima Daiichi, actually. That's why they tried to drop water into the pools by helicopter, and it did not go well at all. So within a matter of hours at that point, the fuel would reach its ignition temperature, the zirconium metal cladding on these tubes that contain the radioactive waste would catch fire, it would spread like a wildfire. It's exothermic. It's autocatalytic. You would have a massive radioactive inferno. And what's really incredible is at least atomic reactors have radiological containment structures around them. We saw at Fukushima Daiichi that they can be damaged, destroyed, still release massive amounts of radioactivity. The pools have no radiological containment structures around them. They're simply in industrial-like buildings. And at Fukushima Daiichi, those buildings were simply destroyed by the hydrogen explosions, rubbleized. So the pools at Fukushima Daiichi are open air. That kind of calamity could strike in the United States, as I said, due to an accident within the plant or a natural disaster. So where are some, where are some of those most high-risk facilities in the United States? How many are there? Well, we have still 100 operating reactors in the United States, and every single one of these reactors has a high-level radioactive waste storage pool. So this is all across the country. Uh, another uh, disaster scenario would be an intentional terrorist attack that directly targeted the pools. So are there any, uh, any in Florida or Boston? Yes, indeed. In Florida, you've got the Turkey Point uh, nuclear power plant near uh, Miami. You've got St. Lucie nuclear power plant. You've got Crystal River, which thankfully is permanently shut down in terms of the reactor. But even at permanently shut down reactors, you still have the high-level radioactive waste stored on site. A lot of it, 75% in the pools. And then up near Boston, you've got one of the most infamous atomic reactors in the country, Pilgrim, which... Uh, we're hoping and praying the reactor will be permanently shut down. But again, you've got, at this point, every single nuclear fuel assembly ever irradiated in the core of that operating reactor stored in a Fukushima Daiichi twin design, one of these GE BWR Mark Ones, just outside of Boston. So why is GE creating or designing uh, pools that have this critical flaw? That's a very good question. Uh, they did it for maximum convenience to the operator of the nuclear power plant. Not only are the pools uh, fatally flawed in design, but the reactors and their containments themselves were, of course, fatally flawed, as we saw times three 
at Fukushima Daiichi, the containments around the atomic reactors were designed too small and too weak, very much just to save money for the purchasers of those atomic plants. Does GE have any liability? I think so. In fact, uh, that recently there was a lawsuit filed in Japan by victims of this catastrophe, and it is uh, seeking reparations from General Electric Corporation itself. Now, let's go to the West Coast. Uh, this radioactive water now is, is heading towards U.S. shores. Uh, it, it will see the U.S. shores in about a month. Uh, how much danger does this pose to humans and wildlife? As we, as we talked earlier, uh, the government saying it's not, but there are other individuals who are saying that it, that it does. What, what's, the, what's the reality here? Well, Fukushima is a catastrophe for the oceans like none we've ever seen before. I mean, Chernobyl was a horrible nuclear catastrophe, but it was more inland. And certainly the Dnieper River flows into the Black Sea and then into the oceans. Fukushima is delivering at this point something like 80,000 gallons per day of radioactively contaminated groundwater into the Pacific Ocean, which then flows our way. It also bioconcentrates in the... Uh, ecosystem in the food chain. So this claim that there's no harm to wildlife, I mean, one of the, the worst uh, data points, so to speak, was in August of 2011, just months after this thing began, when bluefin tuna contaminated with radioactive cesium-137 in their flesh had swam across the Pacific to the west coast of North America, contaminated with Fukushima fallout. They simply swam faster than the ocean currents have carried it, now the ocean currents are bringing it uh, inevitably to our shores. And I mentioned, you know, 80,000 gallons per day. That's on a good day. They have 150 million gallons of highly radioactive water in storage at Fukushima Daiichi, whatever they can capture. They've had big leaks just 10, 15 days ago. They leaked 100 tons of highly radioactive water onto the ground, which then flows into the ocean. They're having these big leaks on a fairly regular basis at this point. Now, you mentioned the tuna. Well, what about the, the, the food industry that creates uh, and, and harvests tuna from the sea? How's that, how is the food industry affected, and are they doing any testing? They're doing uh, woefully inadequate testing. And in fact, U.S. regulations are much weaker than Japan's. So Japan has a standard of 100 becquerels per kilogram of radioactive cesium in food. That's 100 radioactive disintegrations per second, per second, per second, per second, ongoing in 2.2 pounds of food. Here in the United States, our standard is 1,200 becquerels of cesium per kilogram of food. Our standard is 12 times weaker. It means that we could be importing food unfit for human consumption in Japan and it's perfectly legal to uh, serve it to children on the dinner table here in the United States. So then what, what's, the, what, what's the impact to, to us if we eat this food? Any exposure to ionizing radiation carries a health risk for cancer, and those risks accumulate over a lifetime. And there's no uh, following of the health damage that's being done from this contamination of the food supply. And unfortunately, epidemiological science, if it ever gets around to looking at this question, is much less powerful than our ability to inflict cancer upon ourselves. So, you know, cancers don't wear a little flag that says, I was caused by Fukushima fallout. They try to figure that out later, and it's very difficult to do that. So prevention is where it's at, and that is not happening in the United States. Now, what about the average consumer? What would you, what would you tell them? I think that people need to take this whole uh, democratic governance model seriously. It's not a spectator sport. People need to really get involved. They need to put pressure on their elected officials at all levels, from local to state to federal. I mean, there's a lot of divisions of our government that are supposed to be watching out for our best interests. You've got your U.S. Congress member, your U.S. senators, your president. You've got the federal agencies. They are all derelict in their duty right now, and it's going to take a massive involvement of the American people to rectify these problems. Now, what about any, is there any truth to um, any fish kills or any, any massive fish kills in the Pacific because of, of the radiation? I can't say yes or no to that. I'm not out there. I'm not a marine biologist or oceanographer. I think marine biology, oceanography, 
needs to step up to the plate and address these issues. One thing I can say with more confidence is that the Japanese fishing industry in northeastern Japan has been shut down for three years now. So it's another aspect of this catastrophe that doesn't get a lot of attention. But for that fishing industry, for all those、uh, workers, and some of these folks have been fishing for generations in their families,、uh, this has been most devastating. So,、uh, certainly closer into Fukushima Daiichi, these impacts on marine organisms are very serious. And this attitude that the Pacific Ocean is simply very big, dilution is the solution. I would say that is a delusion. It's a delusion to think that diluting radioactivity in the Pacific Ocean is some kind of answer, and we're adding 80,000 gallons per day of radioactive water to the Pacific. So, what do you think the final outcome is going to be? I think we need to shut down nuclear power,、uh, not just in Japan, not just in the United States, but worldwide, because we have suffered、uh, multiple meltdowns at. Three Mile Island 35 years ago, Chernobyl 28 years ago, Fukushima Daiichi units one, two, and three three years ago. It's just a matter of time before we have another catastrophic、uh, atomic reactor meltdown or, God forbid, a radioactive waste、uh, inferno. Our planet is small in size. Every one of these disasters is a disaster that affects all of us in one way or another.